Hi, my name is Frank Phillips. I'm Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at Rush University Medical Center and Director of the Spine Program there. Today I'm going to discuss the role of MRI in identifying signs of multifidus muscle dysfunction. Just to be clear, although we frequently use MRI in our workup of patients, it does not always identify the source of low back pain, which can be quite challenging. The MRI is, however, very useful for identifying signs of atrophy and degenerative changes in the multivitous muscle. We know these are present in patients with functional impairment of the multivitous muscle, and a considerable body of research has suggested that this dysfunction may result in low back pain in many cases. By the end of this video, the viewer will be able to identify axial T1 and T2 images from the L1-2 disc down to the L5-S1 disc, identify the borders of the multifidus muscle on mid-disc images from L1-2 to L5-S1, recognize the difference between superficial and deep multifidus, and classify multifidus degeneration based on existing classifications, for example, the Kajar classification. Distinguish between deep and superficial multifidus degeneration and interpret the extent of degeneration in the context of the patient's clinical presentation. Today, I will highlight some of the key considerations when interpreting an MRI. When ordering an MRI, you can request either T1 or T2 weighted images. In a T1 image, muscle, spinal cord, and the intervertebral disc are gray. CSF is dark, and fat, however, is light or white, as you can see here. In a T2 image, bone and muscle are now dark gray, the intervertebral disc in CSF is light, and so is the signal arising from the fat. For the purposes of this interpretation, what we are really trying to do is measure the multifidus and then determine the extent of degenerative changes and fat infiltration in the muscle. As fat is always white and muscle is always gray, in practice, it doesn't matter much if you make the assessment of the multifidus from either T1 or T2 weighted images. If you have the choice, the nature of the T1 signal gives better contrast between the tissues we're investigating. I'm going to use the T2 images for the rest of this demonstration to make this point. When I do these measurements in my practice, I try and consistently use the same landmarks for every patient. I take an axial image at the level of each disc, starting at the L1-2 disc level and working down to L5-S1. You should be able to identify these levels based on the sagittal images or a scout if it is available. If for some reason you don't have a good sagittal view, look cordially for the S1 disc as the lowest mobile segment. I'm now going to show you the key structures to look out for when orienting yourself before you assess for degenerative changes. Here is a T2 image, and I can tell from the scalp that this is taken at the level of the L4-5 intervertebral disc. You can see in purple the abdominal aorta and the inferior vena cava just below the bifurcation. The psoas muscle is in blue and the intervertebral disc is in white. In a patient with normal intervertebral discs, you can usually see the nucleus pulposus as a lighter area in the center of the disc. But in patients with chronic degenerative disc disease, the disc will appear darker due to loss of fluid. Be sure you're looking at each slice through the disc by observing the foramen, which you see here indicated with the green arrows, and the articulation of the facet joints indicated by the red arrows. Outlined in red in this picture are the two articulating surfaces of the facet joint and the spinous process. We're all here because we want to find the multifidus muscle. But now that we have the other structures identified, it is easy to define. The multifidus occupies a space from medial to the tip of the spinous process along this border between subcutaneous fats. The other margin is encompassed by the bone of the spinal process along the lamina and out to the mammillary and articular processes. Often you can see a fascial margin that separates the multifidus and longissimus here, though in most degenerated cases this can be more difficult to see. While it is important to assess the muscle globally, I also look specifically at the deep multifidus. As we know from the literature, 
that the most medial part of the muscle is responsible for the bulk of the work required for intersegmental stability. One of the best studied and hallmark signs of a degenerated multifidus is fatty infiltration. Although it may be that the muscle is also dysfunctional without the accumulation of intramuscular fat, there is high quality literature that shows a positive association between intramuscular fat, multifidus dysfunction and low back pain. Cage has showed in a population of 412 adults from the general population that this was strongly associated with low back pain with an odds ratio of 9.2. They also developed a simple, reliable way to classify fatty infiltration, conveniently named the Cager grade. Grade zero, such as in this image, is normal. You can see there's next to no high signal in the area we have previously defined as the multifidus. A grade one infiltration is considered slight, as you can see in this image. The threshold for grade one is between 10 and 50% of the area inside the boundary of the muscle being high signal. Grade two is severe infiltration with greater than 50% of the muscle being infiltrated with high signal tissue. There are other grading systems for assessing fatty infiltration into muscles, but in practice they tend to be quite similar to the cager grades. Different parts of the multifidus play different roles in spinal stability and motor control. We know the deep multifidus predominantly stabilizes a single motion segment and provides proprioceptive input into the central nervous system, while the superficial multifidus spans between two and five motion segments and provides elements of segmental stabilization and proprioceptive input. It also contributes to lumbar extension and acts as an antagonist to lumbar flexion. In the presence of low back pain, deep multifidus activation patterns are attenuated or delayed relative to the superficial muscle, suggesting that there's a differential impact of pain on each of the layers. EMG and ultrasound studies have shown that patients with low back pain have a smaller muscle thickness change on maximal voluntary isometric contraction, or MVIC, which potentially reduces the muscle's effectiveness in functional tasks. This observation of reduced contractility is consistent with similar functional changes associated in muscles with fatty and connective tissue infiltration. To be clear, fatty and connective tissue infiltration reduces a muscle's ability to contract, impeding its ability to perform its prescribed task. In the case of the multifidus, these degenerative changes have at least been correlated with the presence of low back pain, and there is a plausible mechanism to suggest that they may be causally linked. MRI should not be a substitute for a thorough physical exam. I use it in my practice primarily to rule out red flags and surgical indications, and secondarily to assess whether multifidus degeneration is present and potentially contributing to the patient's low back pain. The MRI is a valuable tool that you can use to identify patients with multifidus dysfunction. As we've discussed, this has been correlated with back pain and this workup can form an important part of your patient evaluation to help you understand the etiology of your patient's chronic low back pain. Thanks for watching.